Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. The schedule for this meeting this evening calls for a bill to introduce our next speaker. But as all of you know, Bill couldn't be with us last night or neither tonight. But Bill wanted so much to introduce him because he had personally invited him to speak here this evening. I want to attempt to tell you what this man has meant to Bill because nobody would know except Bill himself. But Bernard Smith, in terms of length of service on the board of trustees, of the General Service Board, and as it was formerly known, the Alcoholic Foundation, is our oldest living trustee. Bill has always referred to him as the architect of the structure of our fellowship. Bernard, as many of you know, was for many years chairman of the General Service Board, and served as first chairman of General Service Conference. And even after he decided that it was time for him to step down as chairman, but continuing as first vice chairman, he wrote for us that remarkable document, the bylaws of the General Service Board, which has been hailed as the only spiritually conceived corporate document that though spiritually based, nevertheless complies with the laws of the country. Many of us wish that he'd been one of us, although he tells us that it tells us it hasn't been for the lack of trying. He is a well-known international lawyer and author. And he was personally decorated by the Queen of England and made an honorary commander of the Order of the British Empire. I give you Bernard Smith. thought that AA felt kindly to me, but to put me in a spot to follow one of the most remarkable addresses I ever heard, you know, that wasn't very kind. <clears throat> in fact, I'd suggest it kind of sobers me down to size. My name is Bernard Smith. Rumor has it, still unconfirmed, that I am a non-alcoholic, whatever that means. I, from time to time, I too, you have no monopoly on this, like the rest of us so-called non-alcoholics, have found life unmanageable, but without any help from large intakes of alcohol. Now, perhaps, at no time in history has this land of ours been so torn by dissension, divisiveness, by mistrust. A land which struggles to achieve unity, but with many beginning to despair of finding it. Yet, we are here in convention assembled, as if on an island of unity, in a world sea of disunity. For we have been blessed with a unity that builds upon the spiritual foundation of our society. Thus what we seek now, and will forever seek in the future, is not to find unity, for we now have it, but rather steadily and unceasingly to re-examine our structure to ensure that this precious unity we now enjoy 
will remain in continuity for all time. Now, you may have observed that the title of my talk this evening is Unity and Continuity. The definition of the word unity is our many. I have chosen as the definition applicable to our fellowship that which reads, the quality or state or consisting of one, a totality of related parts. <clears throat> For indeed we are assembled here this evening as a true totality of related parts. For our fellowship is composed of the groups of AA, the separate areas of AA, the General Service Board and its related service organizations, <clears throat> and the General Service Conference, and this convention here assembled on July 4th, 1970. And so the whole of the parts become one, the great fellowship of AA. As for the word continuity, which I have here employed, the Oxford Dictionary defines the law of continuity <clears throat> as changes in nature which are continuous but never abrupt. I refer to these definitions now so that all of you here will be aware by what I mean as I speak of unity and continuity. Indeed, we are unified by being dedicated to a single purpose, energized by a common need, and motivated by human devotion, human decency, and humility. We are a fellowship that is not divorced from life, but one that has spiritually invigorated it and given it, give it, it meaning, and in so doing, created a unity which we here assembled intend to maintain so that the still unrecovered alcoholic and the unborn alcoholics of the future may find within our fellowship the means of achieving sobriety and with it a life that can be meaningful and fulfilling. There is another unity within Alcoholics Anonymous perhaps the most spiritual and rewarding experience of unity that I know of. And this takes place when one of you, in the course of your 12-step work, reaches the heart and the mind of the unrecovered alcoholic. It is a moment in time when the Alcoholics Anonymous sponsor who has delivered the message which lies at the core of our society hears from the lips of the man or woman to whom he has extended his hand, who is still struggling in darkness and desperation, the words, I am an alcoholic. There then comes into being the spiritual unity that springs from the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. There is then a second moment in time when that man or woman who has now been reached stands before a meeting of a group anywhere in this world and once again says, My name is John or Jane and I am an alcoholic. And the joy of his deliverance, as in all humility he accepts that he is one of us, produces another form of unity. For he has strengthened us in our deliverance. For he is our brother who has been returned to us even as we will once return to our brothers and sisters. <clears throat> but the opportunity to achieve this inherently spiritual unity can exist only so long as the unity within the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous continues to remain so strong that it can never crumble. Slowly and painstakingly, we have built upon the spiritual foundation of this great society a structure that I believe that with continued devotion can ensure this, that this fellowship can be insulated against the ravages of time or descent or of materialistic decay. The 
Yes, I view Alcoholics Anonymous today after a quarter of a century of serving it. I am persuaded that it enjoys powerful structural unity. Yet, we can never become complacent with what we have so far accomplished. For human frailties being what they are, we have to make certain as time passes that the structure of our society is strong enough to continue the unity which we have so far carefully nurtured. We must steadily re-examine the structure of our fellowship to determine whether it needs to be shored up and if it needs it to have the courage, the skill, and the inspiration to do what is found to be necessary without impinging upon the spiritual foundation of this fellowship, for it is that which our structure seeks to preserve. Now let me go back to the very early beginning of my association with your great fellowship. I grew to manhood in the age of prohibition. And I would suggest that to many of us <clears throat> that of that era, alcoholic intake served as a means, a very mild one compared to what we see today, of challenging the mores of the society as we then knew it. Violating the law by drinking was a not too unpleasant means of indicating our disdain for the so-called establishment. A fair number of my friends of those years became alcoholics, and some of them drank themselves into oblivion and an early death. Now I've often thought of these friends and of the countless others of that time who were never to hear of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so, too, I have often thought of the God-given gift that was handed to this generation in which we now live, as Bill and Dr. Bob created for you in your time, and for the generations that will follow you, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think two of the men I had known in my youth, sensitive individuals who might have been living today, had Alcoholics Anonymous been born a decade earlier or known of sooner. So today, as we join together in convention assembled, you cannot help, and I cannot help, feeling a deep sense of humility Bill and Dr. Bob lived during our lifetime rather than in some future generation. And so I believe that this great gift coming to you in your lifetime that has fulfilled your lives places upon you a definitive obligation to ensure that this fellowship continues not only in our time, but for all time, so that it may serve the alcoholics of future generations as it has served yours. Now, what it was to be an alcoholic in the days before I had heard of Alcoholics Anonymous prompts me to recall the experience of one of my friends of those years, who was one of the great bureau painters of that time. He was an alcoholic a sensitive human being whose spiritual reservoir had not yet been emptied and could readily have been reached by your fellowship, which was then in its infancy, had it been known to him or indeed to myself. He had been engaged to do a mural painting to adorn the lobby of an office building in lower New York City. Instructions had been left with the architect to give him at the end of each week just enough money to keep him going. Or his friends, as I was one of them, were deeply disturbed over his alcoholism. When he was about two-thirds finished with this mural painting, a member of the architectural firm, unfortunately unaware of these instructions, proceeded to give him an advance payment of some thousands of dollars. 
With this money in hand, this great artist proceeded promptly to drink himself into oblivion and an early death. An effort was made to find another mural painter to complete his work. None could be found with the necessary artistry or skill that this man possessed. It was nevertheless so great a work of art that no one had the heart to summarily destroy it. And so that mural painting remained on the wall of that building until it was torn down. Two-thirds of the painting, a monument to a great artist. The other third, a blank space, the tombstone of an alcoholic. Now, uh, one late afternoon in the early 40s, one of my friends, a former two-fisted drinking companion, an early member of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous, came by to see me at my office, bringing with him two men, one of whom was Bill. They came to me for the purpose of forming a corporation to be called the Alcoholic Foundation. Bill explained to me that he wished me to provide that a majority of the directors or trustees of the foundation be non-alcoholics and a minority alcoholics, or as I was obliged to refer to them incorrectly, you will agree, in the charter of the corporation, ex-alcoholics. I asked Bill why the need for this distinction. Bill said that then, that all recovered alcoholic members of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous are only one drink removed from the gutter. He wanted to be sure at that stage of the early development of our society that it be controlled by non-alcoholics. Now, there was a quality about this man, Bill, with his Lincoln-esque appearance, wearing what looked to me to be hand-me-down clothes, that made me wish to know more about him and about the society which had been briefly described to me. And so, when the meeting at my office ended, I invited Bill to have a quiet dinner with me that evening. At that impecunious stage in Bill's life, I would suggest that the prospects of a good dinner was not without appeal to him. <clears throat> that evening with Bill was one of the most stimulating and significant evenings of my life. As I learned from this remarkable man what it was that made Alcoholics Anonymous work, I learned from Bill that evening why only an alcoholic who has achieved sobriety can reach the still suffering alcoholic in a kind of instant transference. Wish psychiatry could do it, it's very costly. For, as he pointed out, they are brothers suffering from a common materialistic disease. The one a small drink away from oblivion, the other still wallowing in the despair and desolation that only an alcoholic can fully understand. I learned that evening why I, unfortunately only a one-fisted drinker, could never reach the heart and mind of an alcoholic. And why and how one recovered alcoholic who in all humility has accepted life as it exists could so quickly and effectively reach into the heart and mind of a still despairing alcoholic. And that is how my relationship with Bill began. During the more than a quarter of a century that has elapsed since that first meeting, Bill and I, I would suggest, have been the closest of friends. As we work together, as I help them, at least so, Bill tells everyone to build a remarkable structure of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, incidentally, I had a little trouble forming what was then known as the Alcoholic Foundation, later to be known as the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous. But when I prepared the charter providing that a majority of the directors and trustees had to be non-alcoholics with a minority ex-alcoholics, the Attorney General of the State of New York at first refused to permit the corporation to be formed on the ground that this proposed distinction 
three non-alcoholic and ex-alcoholic trustees constituted class legislation which would violate the Constitution of the State of New York. Now, at that time, we had provided for 11 trustees, six of whom were to be non-alcoholics, and five alcoholics, or as referred to in the charter, ex-alcoholics. I was then asked what would happen if there was a challenge to the class qualifications of the trustees. I stated if that should happen, a simple test would suffice. Let the Attorney General send for the 11 trustees to come up to the state capitol, put six whiskeys in front of the 11 men. The six who would reach for the whiskeys were demonstrably non-alcoholics. Not long after I formed the Alcoholic Foundation, I began serving at Bill's insistence as a non-alcoholic trustee. Now, this was a period during which the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous were being hammered out. Now, all of you I know are familiar with Tradition 7, which provides that every Alcoholics Anonymous group ought to be self-supporting declining outside contributions. It must be remembered that at this time, when this tradition was being debated, Bill was living on the ragged edge. A majority of the non-alcoholic members of the board were identified with thriller philanthropic institutions. The concept that we must be self-supporting was a difficult one for men with this background to accept. It was their view that a society which was beginning to contribute so much to arresting the disease of alcoholism should be free to accept outside contributions, particularly since when this, trend, since when this tradition was being debated. We had very little money and from time to time had to rely on handouts to keep going. Moreover, we all wanted to do a great deal more for Bill and Lois to help make their lives more gracious. And we wanted to have the means for expanding the services of the central office and perhaps expedite the growth of groups throughout the land. Yet Bill, with his remarkable pressures, fought these men down and at great personal material sacrifice persuaded everyone to go along with this tradition. He knew then, as all of us in time were destined to learn, that a spiritually based society such as Alcoholics Anonymous must insulate itself from the materialistic pressures that but for this tradition could impinge on the unity of this great fellowship. For Bill saw then that the unity that we must at all times preserve cannot be maintained in a spiritually based society unless we are prepared to surrender immediate and vital personal material needs as builded to ensure that the then still relatively fragile structure of Alcoholics Anonymous would never crumble under the pressures of individual material desires. Bound by this tradition during the years when I served as chairman, I found it necessary to decline hundreds of thousands of dollars of gifts and bequests from grateful friends and relatives of Alcoholics Anonymous. So did Bill design a means for preventing the pressure and power of money from disturbing our evolving unity. Now, after the Cleveland Convention of 1950, your fellowship had begun to grow in numbers. And about then, Bill began to realize that it was becoming essential to the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous that a bridge be built between the Alcoholic Foundation centered in New York and the countless groups within Alcoholics Anonymous which had gushed forth throughout our land like spiritual oases in the deserts of our lives. And so Bill came to the Board of Trustees with the concept of a general service conference 
with delegates representative of the regional areas throughout the land participating. This concept proved to be a far more formidable task than Bill or I had realized. We had on our board at that time, as I have indicated, some trustees with a philanthropic background who perhaps unthinkingly enjoyed the proprietary right to both direct and serve, and let me say, sadly perhaps, that there are a few alcoholic members of the board who too enjoyed the proprietary right to serve. For alcoholic members, Alcoholics Anonymous members I have found are just as human as the rest of us. Indeed, I would suggest just a little more so. Bill and his genius knew instinctively that unless we created a body representative of all of Alcoholics Anonymous, we could well, well reach the point of divisiveness rather than the unity that he more than any of us knew was vital to the continuity of this fellowship. Finally, after exhaustive debate by a majority of only one, a resolution was adopted to hold a single experimental conference. A conference, however, without power, without authority, and constituting, as I expressed it to the board then, as little more than a clam bake. I took the position then, one that I'm glad to say has been continuously followed since, namely that no structural change should be made in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous unless such change is based on the decision of an overwhelming majority and certainly not by the vote, by the vote of such a feeble majority. Now by this time the twelve traditions had been adopted and it was my view that the basic strength of our twelve steps and twelve traditions was such that there could never be need for compromise, that we must ever seek a measure of certainty in considering any change in our structure, or any other cause would imperil our unity. I therefore urge that the matter of convening a general service conference be tabled and the matter be referred back to a committee of uh, which I was chairman and the committee was appointed to reconsider the concept of a general service conference. Some six months later, <clears throat> the concept of holding four annual general temporary service conferences with the final decision of whether to render the general service conference permanent to be made at a convention to be held five years later was adopted by a vote of eight to two. And so the concept of the General Service Conference came into being. And what a brilliant and far-seeing concept this has proven to protect uh, the unity of this great fellowship. Now you will observe that we provided <clears throat> the four experimental General Service Conferences, not just one before we would adopt as a permanent part of the structure of Alcoholics Anonymous this concept of a general service conference. Or again, Bill and I recognized rather instinctively in keeping with the definition that I have earlier quoted, that changes within the structure of AA must never be abrupt. Indeed, Bill and I were persuaded after the first experimental general service conference that we were actually ready to propose that the general service conference become a permanent part of our structure. Nevertheless, in keeping with the concept that change within AA must never be abrupt, that we must be sure we are right before any change is made, we waited out the three additional at annual general service conferences before we recommended that it be made a permanent part of the structure of the fellowship of AA. And so I say to you this evening, as I've said in all the years of my serving your fellowship, that in the natural development of the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous, we may take all the time that may be needed 
in order to find certainty before adopting changes within our structure. For the inherent strength of this great fellowship is such that there will be always be ample time for change. Shortly after the adoption of the resolution for the creation of the General Service Conference at a meeting of the Board of Trot Trustees, of which I was fortuitously absent, I was elected as serve as chairman of the Board of Trustees of the General Service Board and chairman of all the experimental General Service Conferences. Not long thereafter, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous became the recipient of the annual Lasker Award as an outstanding example of successful social pioneering. Bill and I traveled out to San Francisco for me to accept this award on behalf of Alcoholics Anonymous, for because of my questionable non-alcoholic status, I was not cloaked in anonymity. I recall saying then and accepting this award for the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, that we were accepting it not because we had found a means of achieving sobriety, not because those who once drank too much do not drink at all, but because we had found a way to live a spiritually based life in a materialistic society. I stated then that we in Alcoholics Anonymous do not claim any monopoly <clears throat> over the means of achieving sobriety. Indeed, while the sobriety is the end we seek, it is the means by which we attain sobriety that renders this fellowship so unique. For we believe, as Aldous Huxley in his ends and means said, and I quote from him, the end cannot justify the means for the simple and obvious reason that the means employed determine the nature of the end produced. Our personal experience and the study of history make it abundantly clear that the means whereby we try to achieve something are at least as important as the end we wish to attain. Indeed, they are even more important, for the means employed inevitably determine the nature of the result achieved. And so the means which we employ to achieve sobriety determines the nature of the result achieved. For our message to society is not so much that we have succeeded in ceasing to drink, but that by the nature of the means we employ to achieve sobriety, we have found a way to fulfill our lives. But we do not acquire sobriety through the use of a chemical formula or a powerful drug. We achieve it by applying to our daily lives the simple tenets of humility, Honesty, devotion, love, and compassion for these indeed are the heart and the spirit of our twelve steps. It is through this means that in attaining sobriety we learn to live spiritually based lives insulated from the ravages of a materialistic society. Now the evening before the opening of our first experimental general service conference, I had attended a stag dinner of a trade association which I served as counsel, held at the Grand Hope Ballroom of one of New York's major hotels. By the time speeches were in order, the assembled non-alcoholics were in various stages of character change, induced by the relative quantities of liquor that had been respectively consumed. I doubt that there were very many who heard what was said from the platform. Indeed, by the time the evening ended, we were a dreary, unhappy-looking lot of so-called human beings. And so on the next day, as I presided at the first general service conference and looked around at the resident faces of the alcoholic delegates, I wondered what in the world we so-called not-alcoholic trustees were doing here. 
For the delegate members of the fellowship I was addressing or as fine a collective group of dedicated, sober, happy human beings as I had ever had the privilege of addressing. And so it was not surprising that before this conference came to an end, I offered a resolution that we asked for the resignation of all non-alcoholic trustees, including myself, and that henceforth no non-alcoholics be eligible to serve as trustees. I thought at the time, you know, I thought I was quite persuasive. I thought I knew my stuff. However, before the conference ended, I was obliged to leave for a half a day to attend the funeral of a friend of mine. And when I returned and resumed the chair, one of the delegates rose and reported to me that in my absence, the AA delegates had in caucus unanimously decided to vote down my resolution stating that with all due respect to the chairman, we alcoholic delegates regard the continued presence of, of a non-alcoholic majority on the board as necessary to the stability of our fellowship, and moreover, it is we alcoholics who will decide if ever we no longer need the services of non-alcoholic trustees. Now, here's a case where I, as your chairman, unthinkingly in violation of the concept of unity and continuity, had urged an abrupt change to be overruled instinctively by the collective wisdom of the Alcoholics Anonymous delegates. This was my first experience with the General Service Conference in action. I did not, however, give up that easily. Or well, six years later, at the last conference at which I served as chairman, I offered a resolution that henceforth no more than a third of the trustees should be non-alcoholics. Once again, I was voted down. A full decade was to pass before the General Service Conference exhumed my ten-year-old resolution and the change in ratio to one-third non-alcoholic trustees and two-thirds alcoholic trustees was adopted. I report this to you this evening because it indicates how strong is the recognition within the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that changes within the structure of our society will be made only when such changes are unmistakably necessary. For again, it is certainty and not compromise which we must ever seek in maintaining our precious unity. You and Alcoholics Anonymous have long known you have a great and wonderful thing going for you. And I have confidence, based on past performance, that you will continue to resist change unless and until you are certain that such change is essential to serve the unity and continuity that must ever underlie your great fellowship. I have said many times at our General Service Conference during the period I served as its chairman that what is important about the conference is that we are here, serving as guardians of the unity of our great fellowship. And the fact that we are here is of far greater importance than the decisions we make or refrain from making. I have frequently marveled at the collective wisdom displayed at our General Service Conference, the deep and almost subconscious recognition of the importance at all costs to maintain the unity of this fellowship. And so what is important as this convention is not what you do here, do here, but the fact that you are here, assembled in this great convention of your fellowship, where impliedly you are in a position to affirm or disaffirm that which has been accomplished up to now to serve the unity and continuity of this great fellowship, and when necessary, to re-examine our structure to see if any change should be considered to strengthen our unity. Now, after the sixth General Service Conference at which I served as your chairman, I came to the conclusion that in terms of the best interests of the future unity of this society, 
The time had come for me to step down as chairman of the General Service Board and as the first chairman of the General Service Conference in order to establish a tradition that no one has a proprietary right to serve. I had become fearful that a time might come in the distant future when a chairman might have merged with a singular capacity for leadership, but at the same time suffer from an insatiable power drive who might, as a consequence, unthinkingly divert this great fellowship from its basic purposes, principles, and traditions, and create disunity and divisiveness when unity I knew then was vital to the survival of this fellowship. So over the objections of so many of my friends in AA, I resigned as chairman, continuing as a trustee. I would be less than forthright if I did not tell you that at that time I would have preferred to continue as your chairman somewhat longer. But I too had learned during my years of service to your fellowship how essential it is to subordinate individual desires to the greater good and the unity of this great fellowship. And so I decided to establish this tradition that no one has a proprietary right to serve by ceasing to serve as your chairman. Ten years were to elapse before this tradition and this concept of mine that no one shall have enjoy the continued proprietary right to serve became embodied in the bylaws of the General Service Board. This is how we use time, so efficiently, so skillfully, with such love and concern for your fellowship. And so must all of us Bill has done all his life, selflessly strive to subordinate our individual desires and ambitions to the cause of unity of this great fellowship. Now it had been decided at one of the early general service conferences to change the name of the Alcoholic Foundation. A foundation in the common speech of men is generally regarded as a philanthropic organization which solicits funds from the general public to be used for philanthropic purposes. This, of course, is the antithesis of what the Alcoholic Foundation had come to mean, whatever its purpose may have been at its outset. I, who was a so-called non-alcoholic, had not yet acquired the humility that is an attribute of AA life, persuaded almost everyone to adopt a name I had concocted called Alcoholics Anonymous International. A beautiful, prideful name indeed. From the chair at the 1953 conference, I urged the adoption of this name in the place instead of the Alcoholic Foundation. In those earlier years of the General Service Conference, there still remained the modicum of respect for the non-alcoholic chairman most didn't know any better then, but I insisted, as I always did, that everyone who wished to be heard on any motion have an opportunity to speak. There were only a few delegates who spoke against this change of name, but what they had to say made a good deal of sense. Nevertheless, the name Alcoholics Anonymous International was approved by an overwhelming vote, something well over 90%. Yet I in the chair was troubled. I was troubled, perhaps subconsciously, in keeping with the concept of unity. I recognized we must respect the views of a small minority who are as dedicated to the fellowship of AA as the overwhelming majority. I was also persuaded there was really no immediate need to change the name of the Alcoholic Foundation. And the views of this smaller minority, in my opinion, warranted a rethinking of the proposed change of name. I therefore ask that a motion be made to rescind that resolution for a change of name and to table the subject until the succeeding conference. And I suppose out of the undeserved respect for the then chairman, this resolution was adopted. 
By the time of the next conference, Bill came up with the name by which we are now known, the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous, a name of humility, a name that portrays clearly what we on the General Service Board are. For we are there to serve AA and not to direct it. That we on the General Service Board are the servants of Alcoholics Anonymous and not its masters. And as you all know, at the succeeding conference, this name was unanimously approved. Now I refer to this experience because of the example of what I believe constitutes another aspect of unity and continuity, and that is respect for the voices of the small minorities within this fellowship, voices which must never be silenced, for they are as dedicated to our great fellowship as are the majority. And in time, as in the illustration I have made, the views of the minority can well become the views of the overwhelming majority. For this, too, listening to the voices of the few as well as the many, serves the cause of unity. The first experimental conference of Alcoholics Anonymous took place in 1951. There were to be four such experimental conferences before the 1955 convention when a decision was to be finally made as to whether the General Service Board would become the permanent body to serve all of alcoholics for all time, and whether the General Service Conference by its nature was to constitute the basic means of ensuring the unity of Alcoholics Anonymous. I would like, if you'll permit me, now to repeat my closing remarks on the significance of the General Service Conference, <clears throat> as I recommended that it become a permanent part of this great fellowship. For I cannot say it any better this evening than I said it then when I had the responsibility for, for recommendation. For I then thought and continue to regard the General Service Conference as the keystone and the arch of our structural unity. I said then, and I quote, We may not need a General Service Conference to ensure our own recovery. We do, not need, it to, we do need it to ensure the recovery of the alcoholic who still stumbles in the darkness one short block away from this room. We needed to ensure the recovery of a child being born tonight destined to alcoholism. We needed to provide, in keeping with our twelfth step, a permanent haven for all alcoholics who in the ages ahead can find within this fellowship that rebirth which brought us back to life. We need it because we, more than all others, are convers conscious of the devastating effect of the human urge for power and prestige, which we must ensure can never invade AA. We need it to ensure Alcoholics Anonymous against government while insulating it against anarchy. We need it so that Alcoholics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous alone is the ultimate depository of its 12 steps, its 12 traditions, and all of its services. We need it to ensure that changes within AA can come only as a response to the needs and wants of all of AA and not of any few. We need it to ensure that the doors of the halls of AA never have locks on them, so that all people for all time that have an alcoholic problem may enter these halls unasked and feel welcome. We need it to ensure that Alcoholics Anonymous never ask of anyone who needs us what his or her race is, what his or her creed is, what his or her economic or social position is. We need it because in the words of Pope Pius XII, we believe, and I quote from him, every people and every race which has been formed on earth today has an equal right to say, Our Father who art in heaven. So when in the year <clears throat> so
So when in the year following, the General Service Conference took permanent, permanent form, the keystone and the arch of the unity of within the fellowship of AA became securely placed. Changes in our structure since that time have been few, and all of them have been sound. We have moved slowly, carefully, cautiously, and I would suggest skillfully, in building a structure that will maintain the unity of your fellowship in the years that lie ahead. We know that alcoholism will continue to be evident in the societies of the future as in ours, as long as there are grapes on the vine and grains in the f grain in the field. And because human beings are fallible and not without frailties, there will always be those in the generations that will follow us who will seize upon the ferment of the grape and the grain to escape for brief intervals from the false idols of future materialistic societies. It is then to the still unrecovered alcoholics and to those who will be born to alcoholism in the ages ahead that we owe the obligation to maintain and indeed expand the remarkable unity we have thus far achieved. And so this fifth convention in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous now draws to a close. It is rich in its faith, large in its numbers, and dedicated to its purposes. Indeed, it serves as living proof that a spiritually based society can achieve and maintain a durable unity and so serves as a beacon light of hope to a, to a world now so badly disunited. Coming down on the plane yesterday, I found that the cover story of the current issue of Newsweek featured articles by six eminent historians on the American crisis, basically described as a malaise of spiritual crisis. One of these prophets of gloom had this to say, and I quote, We have in short become a loose aggregation of private persons who give higher priority to our personal pleasures than to collective endeavors. The contrary is true of you, for you selflessly are giving the higher priority to the common welfare of Alcoholics Anonymous subordinating your personal pleasures to the collective well-being of your great fellowship. Thus, the life you lead within the concepts of this fellowship brings a message to the world around us. If the world will cease to despair and hear us, and that is that the human race is capable even in this day and age of achieving unity, for well, we have demonstrated within AA that the spirit can take hold of a materialistic society and completely transform it. That man need no longer slink in the shadows, but illumined by the flame of faith can find a light that can shine on a society that is dignified by human decency, human devotion, and human compassion. But this light which now shines so brightly upon you, will flicker and fade if the unity within your fellowship that has so steadily fueled this light should ever be sundered. So let us resolve this night that the unity that has maintained this fellowship and so brought you the life you now know will exist in continuity strengthened and reinforced in this generation, and God willing, in the generations that will follow us. Thank you. Thank you, Byrne.
I'll now turn the meeting over to back over to Bob. Bob. As you know, the theme of this conference is unity within our fellowship. We have asked several of our ex-delegates and some members from overseas to be on stage and participate with us in adopting our new Declaration of Unity. <laughs> AA Unity is the special quality that makes our fellowship unique. It is the cement that holds our society together, the platform that makes AA service possible. It is more than agreement on basic principles, more than freedom from destructive strife. It is a bond fashioned of shared experience, such as this one, we share tonight. Unity is our most precious possession, our best guarantee of AA's future. May we all value and preserve it today and for all the tomorrows to come. Now I'd like to ask the people here on the stage to join with me in the Unity Declaration. This we owe to AA's future, to place our common welfare first, to keep our fellowship united. For on AA unity depend our lives and the lives of those to come. Now I'd like to ask just a few of the representatives of the foreign countries that we have here with us on stage to come up to the lectern and recite this declaration in their native tongue. I'll start out by asking the representatives from Costa Rica, Colombia, Peru, El Salvador, Mexico, Puerto Rico, and the Netherlands Antilles <clears throat> to come up to the lectern at this time and recite this declaration in Spanish. Debemos esto para el futuro de AA, colocar en primer lugar nuestro bienestar común para mantener nuestra asociación unida. De la unidad en AA depende nuestras vidas y las vidas de todos los que vendrán. Will the representative from Norway come forward? Dittes yuller vi AA's fremtid. Og sette vår felles velferd først, og bevare enheten i vårt fellesskap. For på AAs enhet beror våre egne liv, og livet til de slekter som kommer. France. På lærene er det AA nå som til nå. Vi konsiderer av en tulle begjerne de mantener la union de notre fraternité, car la union de AA dépend nos existences et l'existence des générations à venir. Brazil. Eis o que devemos ao futuro de AA. 
situar o nosso bem-estar comum em primeiro lugar, manter o nosso companheirismo unido, porque da unidade de AA dependem as nossas vidas e as vidas dos que hão de vir. Penland. Tämän me olemme velkaa AAAn tulevaisuudelle. Annamme etusijan yhteiselle hyvälle, pidämme joukkomme koossa, sillä AA-veljeys on elämämme tae ja tulevien elämän myös. Germany. This is was we are at zukunft schulden. Unser gemeinsames Wohlergehen an erste Stelle zu setzen, unsere Gemeinschaft in Einigkeit zusammenhalten, weil unser Leben von AAs Einigkeit abhängt, sowie auch das Leben derer, die nach uns kommen. Japan. Iceland. Skuldvar með framtíð aðsamtakana er þessi. Að við látum hinna sameinlegu velferð og rannsetja í fyrirrúmi, að við séum sameinuð, því að það er ekki aðeins vor eigin líf sem byggjast á samhelni aðsamtakana, heldur einnig líf komandi kynslóða. The Netherlands. Dit zijn wij de toekomst van AA schuldig. Ons algemeen welzijn voorop te stellen. Onze gemeenschap eendrachtig te houden. Dat onze levens en de levens van die na ons komen berusten op de eendracht van de AA. Ireland. Ta medsho gyanta agindo e e, ar dush ar ahan lashali, go gadamis ar shinshar eantihe, mardis ar eantis e e, avrahan ar silta agus silta nadini atala chak. Now I'll ask Dr. Jack, the chairman of our board of trustees, Come forward to the lectern and lead us all in a recitation of our declaration. May we all join hands, stand. Hopefully you will have before you the declaration so that we may all read it together. This we owe to AA's future, to place our common welfare first, to keep our fellowship united, for on AA unity depend our lives and the lives of those to come. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.